Yeah, I'm so, only, uh, uh, from Del Rio, I'm only uh, two and a half hours. Oh, wow. Del Rio. Yeah. So I'm kind of right in the thick of all that. Are all you? Going yeah. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. You're in a missionary field right now. Mm. You are. Yeah. Wow. Well, I am super excited just to be with uh, Randy Domain today. Uh, Randy is, um, he's a dear friend. We, we, we go back, how far do we go back? I think we m met in 2005 at the end, maybe? Yeah, I think we, just, we figured that out a while back. It was 2005 at a uh, meeting, I believe, uh, the Intercessors thing or something with Bob Jones. Coeur d'Alene. We I think that was it. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene, yeah. Yeah. So 2005, Coeur d'Alene. And actually, uh, that's right, because you prayed for me. In those days, there was a, a lot of stuff happening with Breakthrough. And yeah. um, I took out about 10 people when you prayed for me. And, yeah. uh, and then the next day, we went to, and the next <laughs> day, we went to uh, actually Akianus, where I got that. That's right, yeah. Yeah, the next morning. And, you uh, gave me the, the picture of Eve eating the, with the grape. Yeah. No, yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah, and I actually, as we went down the steps there, the picture that was on the, the wall of that basement in her studio um, the night before when I did take all those people out, um, I was gone and I was soaring uh, through this place in space to this white area place. I said, Lord, what's going on? I was completely caught in a vision. And he said, I'm taking you to heaven a different way. I said, well, where are we going? He says, right through there. And we went right through there. And on the other side, we landed at a lake. And, um, and as I walked down that steps, I said, I've been there last night. And she kind of smiled at me. She says, I've been there too. And, and uh, turned the corner, and there was the picture of the lake that I was at the night before. It was kind of like, what? This is crazy, yeah. man. That so, is so awesome. Yeah. yeah. You don't remember that. I do. I remember you yeah. being astonished when you saw the painting. That she, I don't remember if it was complete or if she was just working oh, no. on it. But I, yeah. I remember when you saw the painting, it you kind of it over it overwhelmed you. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty crazy. So those were amazing days. Amazing, you know, God oh, has yeah. a way to amaze us all the time, mm -hmm. out or whatever. But so, we're talking. I'm talking to Randy today about a subject we've actually never addressed at Mo. Um, and I don't know if Randy purposely didn't address it because he wondered what I would think of it <laughs> or <laughs> if, if, um, if it just wasn't the season, wasn't the time for us to know that. But recently there have been some things that have been really kind of uh, coming to the forefront in a number of different areas. Uh, I know that this month we're in 2021, June right now. Um, that there is coming out publicly, um, governmentally, um, a release of uh, some findings that they've had, um, which a number of people have jumped on and, and wondered, is, um, is this going to be a great deception that's coming um, that's going to affect the church? Is it going to affect believers? Um, is it... Um, uh, some are just saying, is it even legitimate? And, um, and, I, and I get why they're asking that. But um, honestly, I think that we are, we're headed into one of the craziest times um, in world history. Uh, you know, actually, we could say that about tomorrow and it'll be truer tomorrow than it is today. <laughs> the reality is, is that things are accelerating. They are compounding. They are becoming... Um, more uh, difficult to, to comprehend as the days go by uh, in some ways because there is a, um, an extreme energy behind this whole thing, both spiritually, um, emotionally, uh, even physically for people, that there's something that we are headed into where we feel like we're being propelled, catapulted um, into the future days. And, 
and we have people on every end of the expre- the spectrum whether you know you know Jesus could come back today uh, for some others are like no this isn't the time um, but regardless of all those things we are in a moment where we have to begin comprehending and understanding what it is that God has for us in the days to come and um, and I think it's very important and I I brought up one verse and then we're gonna go for it Randy um, I think the reason this is so important to us actually is uh, the second Corinthians 2 10 through 11 this is the reason it's important um, he talks about forgiveness and incidentally we're going to talk a little bit more about things that we take in as far as sin in in our lives because when you take sin in it has an, a dramatic effect on your life and so it says if you forgive anyone i also forgive him that's how he begins that verse and and what i forgiven if there was anything to forgive i have forgiven in the sight of christ for your sake but here is the key to this passage in order that satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes and i believe that one of the things that we're headed into is a whole season of history of, of a future uh, that has profound uh, stuff in history that we can look to and we can say, this is what the enemy has always done. This is how he's always worked. Um, we're not unaware of it. We know how he works. We know how he works in believers. We know how he works in the world. We know how he makes his foothold. Um, it says of Jesus that there was nothing the enemy could grasp on him. There was no foothold. There was no stronghold. It says that we, we are to be angry yet sin not. Don't give the enemy a foothold. Don't give Satan a foothold. That there, there are places the enemy can get in. And, and so as a result, we're not unaware of that. We're very aware of that. But there are things that are far more sinister and, um, and actually larger in history that we can go, um, that we can learn from. And uh, God has given Randy uh, a lot of profound uh, insight and revelation on this through the past number of years that I've known him. Um, I know some of you have probably heard uh, Randy in various uh, situations, but I want to find out from him for us. Uh, he's been in a number of our meetings, so he knows who we are. But I, I, I really want to talk to him um, about this subject today because I think it's very important. And um, uh, Randy, what are your thoughts? Let just go go for. It. What are you thinking here? Well, uh, I guess you're couching some of this in uh, the fact that. The 25th of June, is going, the government's going to give the UFO disclosure. And with that, we'll open a can of worms. And the disclosure can go one of two ways. Um, it can be secular in the sense that the disclosure could be a pre-footing to uh, justify ramping up the military-industrial complex for space war expenditures, which would enrich the cabal and so forth and so on, or it could be the biblical end of the spectrum, which would be to set up or tee up, if you were, um, the days of Noah, uh, yeah. where we actually had the interterrestrial being interaction with humans, uh, the degradation of all of human society, uh, the hybridization, the mixed breeding, uh, messing with all of creation, changing the DNA, the altering it, uh, the uh, beginning of the demonic, all of that um, can come out here very soon on the 25th. So I don't know if the government's going to give more of a secular view uh, of this. Um, I mean, there was a guy, uh, Warren uh, Von Bonn, who developed the uh, Saturn V rocket, and he confided uh, to a reporter and this is what he said, quote, he said, the last card the U.S. military is going to play is to weaponize space uh, with an extraterrestrial threat, which would justify ramping up our whole military industrial complex, which those of us who know and understand, that's the evil cabal corporations that enrich themselves through this type of uh, medium. So it could be simply that, or they could come out and say, you know what? Hey, Roswell was real. Yeah. And we did capture a disc and we did get some aliens, which then all of a sudden opens up this question, aliens, what are aliens? And we have a biblical worldview and there's a, you know, a worldview that the, that 
you know, society has. So there's a lot of things that could come out in the days ahead and that all of it relate to um, this whole uh, concept, this whole biblical worldview of good versus evil, of evil wanting to eradicate uh, humanity. And uh, we're right in the middle of that scenario. But if they come out and say, okay, uh, aliens are good, well, that sets up another scenario. So what's that mean? So then we have what we call the alien gospel, where the aliens come and say, hey, uh, we seeded this planet. You're our you know, offspring. We're your progenitors. We, we actually created you. And we sent you Confucius and Buddha and Jesus. And we sent you all these people uh, to tell you about us or to give you an insight into us. And, and now you're at the point of destruction. You're about to go into some kind of war, nuclear war. Therefore, we've come to intervene to save your society and by the way, we are your gods. Therefore, bow down and worship us. Uh, we want to be worshipped because we are your gods. And uh, by the way, uh, this will become a new one world government, one world religion, one world finance. And uh, sets up the whole other thing we know from many interviews of, from uh, UFO abductees that they have been chipped to change their DNA. So here we go with this hybridization you know, project where uh, humans begin to be non-human, therefore non-redeemable, therefore that whole scenario where Satan says, um, I'm going to take away all of God's believers and they're not going to be redeemable, just like in the days of Noah, just yeah. like before the flood, because Jesus said that's the sign, Luke 17, 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So this UFO disclosure and all these things you're thinking of, could open that can of worms for the days of Noah to begin to play out in the earth again with the interdimensional beings, the crossbreeding, the, the DNA changing of all of humans and animals. It all could come. The whole black awakening, the whole chaos, the whole revelation 913 could be a setup for the whole thing. So yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah. It was very interesting. You know, last week I was talking with some kids. Um, I mean, little kids. And um, well, I, I, I think the oldest was 15. And um, it was so fun, you know, because they're tell us what's up. And but in the process of that, we were thinking through different things. And, you know, even in the media and stuff, things have uh, there's been a crossbreeding in the media. You've had um, that which is natural or uh, mechanical or uh, a, some kind of a synthetic thing merging with the physical the DNA. And in the process, um, this one thing came out that, that is actually real. It's very true. Um, the reality is, is that God, the father who is spiritual in every way, but probably far more than that, but spiritual in every way actually seeded Mary who is physical and it produced the offspring of Jesus who fully man, fully God. And, and there was a merging of two entities in that regard. Now that was the true way. The counterfeit is obviously what we see in Genesis six, um, that, that the enemy maybe saw what was happening and said, we're going to seed from the spirit realm negatively into the physical realm. And they raise these Nephilim. I don't want to go too far into that, but you can go as far as you want to go. Um, but I, I've just become very aware that this is not a new concept that, that in fact, it's been literally as old as the earth. It goes all the way back to Noah and that, that the enemy has always tried to interject himself into the affairs of men, that he's always tried to overpower it. Um, um, what was the word, you know, um, deceive it, um, usurp it uh, from, from men that he wanted the rights, he wanted the ability. Um, the giants um, who, who, who would come, they, they functioned as usurpers. We own this, we run it, we're bigger than you. We're gonna take, take over. It's a serious bully thing that, ha that, is, that, that has been released. Um, and it continues to this day. Uh, not just in that realm, it happens actually in the spiritual realm, that that is where bullying comes from. It is a spiritual, a demonic spiritual realm that would place yourself above another person, which Jesus came to undo completely. 
and set himself below all. And um, so anyways, it's just a, it was a thought. And, and when we talked with the kids, it was just, they, it, it was amazing to hear um, just their response to the whole thing. You know, that they actually had pretty wise understanding um, mm-hmm. in, in regards to what, what could be happening. So anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt, interrupt you. Um, oh. t- tell us what, where do you think, be specific with us. Be, talk, talk to people who have no understanding right now of Nephilim. They don't even know what they are. Uh, and I've talked to people in the past couple of weeks ago, ne- what's Nephilim? Uh, you know, they're hearing it for the first time. And um, they don't understand how this could even transpire. They're just like, what? And are they still here? Were they killed in the flood? What? Tell us about them. Well, okay. So uh, the Nephilim are actually in your Bible. Uh, different versions translate the word Nephilim in different um, terms. Uh, sometimes the Nephilim are called giants. Sometimes they are called uh, Rephim, which they've left in the Bible. Sometimes they're called sons of Anak. We know them as Og. We know them as uh, the giant that David fought. Uh, so they're, they're in your Bible. Those are Nephilim. The question is, is where in the world did they come from? Well, they... They're first mentioned with clarity in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, where it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful. They took wives for themselves of them, went into them, which is a sexual term, and produced an offspring, men of no melody. So we see in Genesis 6, right from the very beginning, we see that these, this, this hybrid race, this race of giants came into the earth as soon as Genesis 6. The backstory to that is, if I can get up to speed and then take it further, we know about the temptation in the garden of, uh, of Adam and Eve, of Eve in particular. We know that a serpent tempted her. Uh, that, that serpent is actually an ash. It's an Elohim. It's a son of God. Um, we know that it tempted her to sin. She did. And uh, as a result of that sin, there was a curse placed upon her and mankind and the serpent. And Genesis 3.15 really is a nutshell of it. It says that, that her seed uh, uh, will be an enmity with his seed, speaking of Satan. They're both talking there. And it goes on to say that, that the seed war would be that her seed will bruise your head, but your seed will only bruise his heel. That's the first actually prophetic uh, insight that we have of a Messiah coming who will bruise the head of Satan. So we see Messiah clear back there, but we see this person coming forth who's going to bruise the head of Satan, this this usurper, this deceiver in the garden. And and by the way, the whole reason for this usurpation back in the garden was about who was going to rule the earth. Because God had designed man. Be who can multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. In God's divine counsel, humankind, mankind was to rule the earth. And the divine counsel, Psalms 82, the sons of God were to rule the realms of heaven. Well, they didn't like it. They didn't like man going to rule the earth, so that's what they did. They rebelled against God, so they ruled heaven and earth. So anyway, that's a basis of a long story and a long fight that still goes on today about ground, holy ground, realm, distinctions, all of that. But anyway, so the the point was is that then Satan, once he found out that somebody was going to bruise his head, he set out from that point on to find out who that was because he knew there was a savior or a deliverer coming through Adam and Eve, who would restore them to that Edenic-like garden paradise. So the first one, of course, they thought was Cain. Well, they found out when Cain and Abel brought their offerings and God rejected Cain's offering, he knew that Cain uh, was not going to be the savior, but Abel could be. So the line of Abel. So he re- uh, rose up Cain to kill Abel. What did he do? The whole thing from there on goes with this scenario. Satan did everything possible to kill, circumvent, or cut off the rise of the bruiser, the savior. And we see that all throughout Old Testament biblical history where the, uh, Satan and, and the, his fallen angels and his cohorts do everything possible to keep the rise of a savior who will restore man's rule on earth and Adam and Eve. So anyway, we go all the way down. And in the time of Jared, we find from the apocryphal books, particularly uh, Jubilees, uh, Jasher, Enoch in particular, we find 
from those books uh, that were, you know, recovered from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran. And by the way, we're in the canon of scripture until 553 AD when the scholars thought that that was too uh, disconcerting for us. So they took it out. So many modern Christians don't have the advantage of the perspective of Old Testament writers and understanding of the events that went on. So, so we come up and we find Jared in the time of Jared, um, God sent forth these angels, good angels, to watch over man and to help them follow his ways while they became corrupt. And uh, further on down the line, we know from the book of Enoch uh, and uh, other writings that these 200 angels uh, with Satan, they agreed together to come into the earth to procreate with women and produce this race of hybrids, half man, half angelic, half celestial, half terrestrial flesh. And they did it. And that's recorded in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. The, the offspring was these hybrids, which we know subsequently were the giants. We know that from Numbers 13. When the Israelites went into the land, there were giants there. And we know that all through scripture, Abraham had to face them. Uh, Joshua, Moses, everybody had to face these giants. All those giants were produced, number one, to bring an absolute circumvention of ever letting the Savior rise, of ever letting the children of Israel come into their land, of ever letting man recover his place as ruler of the earth, so forth and so on. So we see all that going on. So the giants actually came. Um, the Nephilim, uh, translated the fallen ones, actually first show up in Genesis 6, and then we see them all throughout Scripture all throughout scripture and we see their offspring even in the new testament not as giants but as the serpent seed the genesis 315 seed uh in the form of pharisees sadducees who jesus said uh, you are your father the devil you're a brood of vipers so we see that same spirit functioning then trying to circumvent uh the truth and hold down suppress society for the truth but these giants came, and they were real, and they are very, very real. They record all through scriptures. Uh, the battles uh, were all there in many of the battles, and so that was their origin. They are um, a hybrid from uh, fallen angels that um, came uh, into the earth and made it with women. And you go, well, prove that. Okay, well, let's go to the New Testament. Second uh, Peter two four and five says, God did not spare the angels that sinned. Oh, the angels sinned. How did they sin? You go to the book of Jude 6 and 7. It says that they left their proper domain, their habitation, their rule, and they came and they cohabitated as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Is the example they gave us, which we know is licentiousness and every other form of immorality. So we know that they came and that they uh, produced offspring with the human women. So that the angels did sin. How did they sin? They sin by sexual perversion, DNA alternation, the whole nine yards. So there's the New Testament backing up what Genesis 6 says. So uh, just in a very, you know, small nutshell, that's who the Nephilim are. That's where they came from. They are called the Nephilim, singular. Um, uh, so that's what they are, giants. So they, they still live? Yes. Okay, so the flood did not kill them. Yes, it 100% killed them. But the they came back. 200. Yes. If you look at Genesis 6, it says, um, uh, let me just read that. That way I can get it clear. So people are getting specific on it. It says, um, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, those are Benai Elohim, sons of God, those are angels. Those are fallen angels. Benai Elohim are sons of God. And by the way, the only way you can be a son of God in the Old Testament is to be a direct creation of God. So the only sons of God in the Old Testament were Adam and the angels. That was the only direct creation of God. So that's the only ones that qualify as being a son of God. They're not sons of Zeth. They're not uh, many of the other things that have, they have been described. They're not. They're angels. And we know from Daniel 2, Daniel 4, that these angels were watcher angels. And we know that these watcher angels um, very clearly were of a teraphim class. They were later made idols in worship. So we know um, that um, they were angels. So these sons of God made it with these women. And this is, goes on to say the sons of God saw the daughters of men. So it makes it very clear there's a difference between who these sons of God are right. and the daughters of men. Okay, That they were beautiful, that they took wives for themselves of all, all whom they chose. And watch this. 
it says um, that um, daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw daughters of men that they were and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And it goes on to say in verse four, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So we're talking about giants, pre-flood giants, post-flood, Genesis six. When the sons of God came to the daughters of man, they bore children to them who were the mighty men, who were the men of old, men of renown. So this word here, it says, um, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, that can just as easily be translated whenever. So we know that, um, yes, the flood was effective. We know it was 100% effective because when God made the new covenant with Moses, or excuse me, Moses, uh, with, uh, um, yeah, Moses, I guess it was, um, that he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. He didn't say subdue it. Um, by the way, I'm sorry, the covenant with Noah, that's what I'm trying right. to say. He said, you can multiply, fill the earth. He didn't say subdue it like he did in Genesis 1. Right. Why? Because there was nothing to subdue. Everything was wiped out. All of it was taken away. So we know there was a second incursion and more after the flood. So as the fallen angels came before the flood, there was another incursion that came after the flood and continued to come over a period of time until the Nephilim themselves started producing their own. And we see that in Numbers. We see that in the battles of the land of Canaan. We see that um, uh, that that uh, the giant that David slew, Goliath had five brothers. Uh, there's many links to where the Nephilim began to reproduce within themselves and produce their own offspring. So there was a continuation right up until David finally took the majority of them out, except for a few that are over in the Gaza Strip where they that was their stronghold, Ashhad and Gaza and all that. So there's, they were, there was still a contingency there. Um, but they were 100% killed in the flood, so there was a second incursion that brought them back. And then after they were finally annihilated, for the most part, in giant form, then this, the, their spirit, the spirit of what they were doing, who they are, um, began to be carried by the religious group, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, and others. And so there was a continuation, not of them so much bodily as it was yeah. their spirit. So interesting. And a little later, we're going to talk about this because I think the whole term seed comes into this very, very clearly um, that we'll, we'll get there. But um, so, so today um, you would say that the Nephilim today functioning today are functioning pretty much by that, that the seed of that Nephilim is in individuals in what? Yeah, anyone who chooses to rebel against God, they open themselves up to the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of the Antichrist, which yeah. is the spirit, the seed of Genesis 3, um, that offspring, they are of that offspring, not, not today so much physical as they are in a spiritual sense. So the seed is... Physical, and it's also spiritual. Today, okay. we're dealing with the spiritual seed in this realm. However, there is that seed that is in the heavenly realms, because if you remember, one third of the angels fell with Satan. Only 200 came to the earth before the flood, but there's still the remaining of that one third that are in rebellion against God. They are the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places that we're battling today. So they're, they are actually a, a, a form in spirit, but they have or can take a human form, but those that are manifesting on the earth today are primarily in Follow spirit me. forms. However, there are a lot of beings in the earth today that are Nephilim. And I promise you that I've seen them, many have seen them. We see their eyes, we see the snake eyes. I mean, we see the grays, we know about the underground bases. I could go down the rabbit hole, but they're here. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. In fact, this is the first time that actually, as you've been talking, I thought, mm, this is probably probably where the whole Freemasonry thing uh, really began was, you know, it talks about the noble men. And I went, this is probably where it was, but anyways, um, because that's what they think they are. But um, yeah, I want, I want to touch something because you, you, you went into it. So I will. And I shared something a few days ago uh, with some people and they were like, what? No way. I just don't believe that. But um, 
you know, I, I because there's many different terms. In fact, let me let me just go ahead and look at that real quick, just to kind of pull it up that I wanted to talk about a little bit today. We, and we talk about angels, obviously God's angels, a third of them fell, fallen angels. Mm-hmm. And I, I personally believe that they are the principalities, powers, and the rulers in dark places. That's what I, I believe. Um, I do not believe, I do not believe people are inhabited by fallen angels. And so people I say, totally agree. are these not the demons? I said, no. They said, well, where do the demons come from? And then they, they, they also, I don't believe that they are inhabited by Nephilim. Nephilim are a unique breed in and of themselves. I said, demons. They said, well, where do the demons come from? Here's what I said. I'm going to quote a couple verses. I think sin, when it gives, gives birth, when we allow sin in our lives, it develops a, a system, a pattern of thoughts that builds and becomes a stronghold. Um, years ago, Francis Frangipan would go into some of this stuff that, that a stronghold is a house built with words or thoughts or opinions. And I believe that through that, those, if, if we're angry, as an example, and we do not deal with the bitterness, we do not deal with those things that literally that anger increases, increases till eventually that anger controls us and we do not control it. And that it forms, it's a seed of rebellion. It's a seed that comes from the enemy. Is it real? Absolutely real. I've dealt with them. You've dealt with them. Um, real demons that you have to actually cast out of people. But where did it form? I believe it formed in the, um, the allowing of the wickedness into your life. And, and as a result of that, this thing grows, it becomes huge, and it begins to take over. Does it form? I don't think they're like little goblins. Now, they may manifest as a little goblin um, in, the, in the fruition of the final places of a, of a demon. We know that Jesus, when he dealt with the demoniac, and he said, they said, kick us out, you know, into the pigs. That the reality, what Jesus, the, the normal pattern in that day was they would be sent to the arid, dry places. And these demons, these spirits that were inside people, controlling people didn't want to go to the dry aired places. They'd rather be in another place that could host them, if you will. And so you send us into the pigs and which didn't result in good for the demons either way. It didn't really matter. But, but the reality is, is that, that demons want to be hosted. They want to be hosted by people. And so that's where bitterness comes in. That's where lust. In fact, it was very interesting that whole scenario with the Nephilim, as I thought about it, in Genesis 6, the sons of God saw, change the word, lusted after the daughters of men. Mm -hmm. And it was this sin that was conceived that bore forth, forth, and that's what James says. When tempted, no one should say, God's tempting me, but God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, that's a birthing term. That's a seed term. It gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Um, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for man's anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God's desire. Therefore, get rid of all this moral filth. Get rid of this stuff because those are the access ways. And then in 2 Corinthians 10, and then I think this is the last verse I have here, but 2 Corinthians 10 um, Three, for, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that self, sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So in, 
in my scenario, as I began sharing this with people, people were like, what? Oh, no, that's not where demons are. You know, that you're not. And, and they say, well, are there more demons today or less? Or do we make, are we creating demons? I said, well, well, actually it's, it's the seed, which is exactly what you've said. It's a seed. You know, it went into the Pharisees. It went into the Sadducees that the seed, the seed always multiplies. You throw one seed in the ground, more come. So the reality is, is does that mean there's increase? Well, there's increase in demonic things when that seed is sown. And so it's not like we had five in the beginning. So we have five now And I'm picking a very small number. It's like you had five in the beginning, but as people allow this to increase, there's an increase. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the, que- one of the things for us as believers to begin to understand, well, well, we cannot give the enemy any kind of a place inside of us to manifest. And, and people are, well, well, I've seen demons transfer from one person to another. That's exactly right. They do. Why? Person has trauma, person has anger, person, and it goes from this person to another person. It doesn't mean that that demon is not transferable. We don't want that to happen, obviously, but, but that's, that's all the more reason why, why we need to understand we, can, we must deal with what God is uh, letting us walk through so that there is no place for that to access into our lives. So I don't know um, if you even want to give your thoughts on that. <laughs> But, uh, well, I think that, uh, that's a very good uh, analogy. It really is true that sin is an open door to spiritual uh, oppression or even to the point of possession, um, depending upon the level you give yourself over to a particular sin. The, the New Testament calls it the spirit of iniquity. Yeah. And that spirit of iniquity is that very thing. It, the spirit of iniquity looks for an iniquity, a lawlessness, a rebellion, a sin, and to attach itself to by a spirit. Right. And uh, so we, we see this very thing happening. And we even know that spirits like have names. If you look in the New Testament, Jesus cast out the, 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 the spirit of death, the spirit of dumb. I mean, he, they actually have names that they go and attach, attach to people and manifest themselves to. We also know that the sins of the father are passed to the children. So if a father is in a certain type of sin, say alcoholism, it's likely that that same sin or that pre- disposition towards that sin will be passed to the children or some other kind of thing if they're not an alcoholic maybe they'll be giving to you know to overeating or something but it manifests and it's a spirit driven behavior it's a spirit driven because they're given to it because they're predisposed to it by the sins of the father or they can start the sin themselves so what you're saying is absolutely right Uh, it's amazing uh in the scripture jesus tells us to to seek and to knock right the scripture of prayer and he yeah. says, if, if, a fa- if, if a child asks for a bread, will he give him a stone? If he asks for this, will he give him, you know, a, a serpent? Well, what's, what's he, Jesus saying? He said, well, on the wicked side, when the children ask for something, their fathers refer him to an idol or to a spirit. But when you ask the father God for something, he doesn't refer you to an idol or a spirit that can give way to demonic activity. He refers you uh, to himself, to Christ. He he gives you the answer as the father who will give what you're asking if you're in clean manner. So all of that ties together and, and it, it's very real. And, and uh, what I personally believe is that um, from what my studies is that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Right. I think it's very, very clear. And so that's where they came from when the Nephilim were drowned in the flood and subsequently died even after that. Those spirits, they're unclean. They're not righteous. They can't be saved. They can't be redeemed. They will ultimately be judged and put, you know, right. uh, in, in the lake of fire. But for right now, there's no judgment because Jesus said they're unclean spirit. He called. He actually calls them unclean spirits. They're not angels. Angels have a body. They don't need a body. Demons don't have a body. They need a body to manifest. Yeah. And so uh, we see that. In fact, um, let me just read this. From it's real quick. From this is Enoch 15 8 through 12. It says this concerning uh, demon spirits. Uh, it says, And now the giants who are produced from the spirits and flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies, 
because they are born from men and from the holy watchers in their beginning and primal origin. They shall be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits of the earth, which are born upon the earth, on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. They take no food, but not nevertheless they hunger and thirst, and they cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men, and against the women because they have proceeded from them. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, there's several other accounts in Jasher Jubilees and other apocrypha, but I mean, that's a pretty clear definition. You know, that, uh, and, and what you just said is very interesting. I did not list disembodied spirits, but the other day I did on, on my, because I talked about another one. I said, I'm not going to talk about this too much right now. So you're talking about it, but the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. And, um, so that's that's really good. Appreciate that. Well, it takes time, Danny, uh, to hear a truth and then to let it go through, filter through all what you think you know or think you have been taught, and right. then actually get to a place of truth. It's a process. So first of all, it's your first thing is you hear something that doesn't sound right, so you just block it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you do a truthful, honest, scriptural study, there is no harm in exploring any theory through the lens of scripture because ultimately yeah. the truth will come out. Yeah. And so I know that when you present something like that, I mean, I started teaching this back in 2012. And I mean, people would get up and walk out there and jaws would drop to the ground. Uh, I lost, I can't tell you how many pastoral friends and conference states and things. But anyway, um, now, what I have been teaching and others concerning the Nephilim, um, and why is it important that we talk about the Nephilim today? Because Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, when the Nephilim manifested and corrupted every human being on the face of the earth, except Noah and seven other people. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So what wow. happened in the days of Noah will repeat in these last days. It ties in with the UFO, it ties in with the demons, it ties in with the aliens, which are not aliens, they're fallen angels. We all know that masquerading as uh, aliens, they're interdimensional beings between heaven and earth. We know their story, we know their scheme, we're not unwise. And so it's really important that we talk about this, Danny, very important because with this you know, exposure coming or this disclosure coming, it could put in motion so many things. And what you're touching on about the iniquity, about the sin, about the lawlessness giving access or an open door or demonic oppression or possession is very important that we get ourselves clean of these things because to the level that we are deceived is the level the enemy controls. Yeah. And uh, so if we don't believe, uh, you know, about demons, if we don't understand them, that Jesus said, cast them out. Why? Because we have authority over them. Yeah. He didn't say entertain them. He didn't say list their doctrine because it, you know, we oh. know the doctrine of demons is going to come in the church. He said, cast them out. That means we can recognize them. We can discern what it is. We can understand uh, by the lens of scripture, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we need to be cleaned up because what's coming, we, we don't, you know, need to be, uh, you know, set up for deception. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, the first thing he said about the end times, he says, don't be deceived. Don't oh. be deceived about the activity of men and nations. Don't be deceived. The only way not to be deceived is to be clean of demonic confusion and interruption in your spirit. So come on. Yeah. Come on. That to me, to me, it's one of the things that um and, and I I I have begun to see the, the importance of it. And that's what I because I'm I'm so aware I I, I have people I know very close to me who they're all over this alien thing and that this is going to be exposed. And, and, you know, well, maybe, maybe there's other places where, um, where they have existence and maybe, you know, Jesus isn't God literally stating those things that maybe this is just our personal reality of here on earth, but there's another whole reality that, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is serious deception that is trying to enter. And, yeah. um, and we have, we have to uh, not just simply ignore it and say, well, that's just demonic. It's like, well, we know it's demonic. 
but we have to know, uh, you have to give a reason for the hope that's within you. You know, you, you have to know why, why are you confident of this? What, what is it about Jesus that is so different than this? And when we begin understanding that literally God has been speaking about things from the creation of the world. Um, I mean, I just to, uh, that little, that little snake in the garden was not a normal snake. You know, you read Isaiah 14, you read Ezekiel 28, you begin realizing, um, yeah, this, this sucker was not normal. He could, he led the host of heaven in song. He was beautiful. He had gemstones all over him. He was, this was not your normal. He walked. This was not a garden snake and that, and that you begin understanding he deceived Eve um, and Adam. And, and later on, you, you re- God rebukes Adam, not Eve. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, so, it is. yeah and that because they were one, that they literally mm-hmm. carried the same, that it was it, what she was, he was, he, she was in him, that together they were one. And so as a result, her failure, her falling was, was, was not, we, we tend to think, what an idiot. Why would you listen to a snake? It's like, no, you don't understand the deceptiveness. The nature of this serpent was huge. It has messed up whole civilizations for for thousands of years that have been caught in these places. And so um, I just it it just to me is the the amazing, the amazing place of, uh, of of hearing what God has. Um, to do um, with us as a people in removing the deception from us. So we go, wait, 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 so I, can't, I can't go here. I've, I've got to think differently. I've got to think. Yeah, so I absolutely agree, Daniel. You're really hitting the nail on the head. I, I mean, we know that the serpent was a cherub. We know that that's a divine being. He was a son of God. He was a leader of the sons of the divine council, the rulers of the nations of the earth. We know all that. Uh, so we understand that that he was also stripped of that to a degree, uh, but not so much so because he told Jesus, um, if you bet on and worship me, I'll give you, you know, the nation. So he, he has that because when Adam fell and, and gave the rule of the earth over to him, um, he has those, he has that rule. And that's what we're facing today, you know, is that rule, he has his rule in the earth, but uh, we have authority and power over him and his rule. Yeah, and we have to know that we we can't um, be giving into all of these um, fear tactics, into rolling over with every doctrine or every new thing that comes. Um, we as believers, born again sons of God, have authority and power on the earth. In fact, Jesus said, "Behold, I gave you authority and power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you." I don't know when we're going to believe that, but we really need to believe that as born again sons of God. This yeah. alien deception, it's going to be amazing. The deception was back in the garden. If you eat it, you will become as God. Yeah. Knowing good and evil. It's the same deception that's going to come with this alien disclosure of some form. It's going yeah. to say, if you, you know, you will, if you, if you believe us, you will become as gods. In fact, you'll live for three, 400 years. We'll give you this implant. You have disease free, sickness free. We'll give you free technology. I mean, we're going to give it all to you. If you if you take this chip, you will become as gods and live and be immortal. I mean, it's the sure. same deception repackaged. Yeah, it's unbelievable to me. Um, but we're watching it. We 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 are seeing it, and and we're seeing it in um, in areas where you know the media has seeded a generation to believe the lie. Uh, we have seeded a generation to believe. Um, some things that, in fact, God will do in the days to come, where there will be the raising of the dead by the thousands. And the media has seeded a generation to talk about zombies and the walking dead. The, the, the media has, has twisted everything. It's, and, 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 and yeah, it, it takes stuff. And, and so people have become calloused to what's true. Um, and they'd rather believe the lie. Uh, Romans one, but um, that there's more of a of a disposition on people to believe a lie than there is to believe the truth, um, and it is seeded every facet of society in that way. And so, 
I think it's very important that people who know the Lord um, go to him first. Um, I, you know, I want to, I want to bring up a passage because this is something that happened to you and I, we were um, in 2009, we were in a meeting in, in uh, Middleborough, Mass. Remember that? Um, it was uh, the greatest awakening. Was that number two or number three? I can't remember. But um, okay. we, were, um, we were there together. And there was this crazy fervor that was happening in worship. And we were, we were sitting on the front row. And all of a sudden, people fell forward and people fell back. That's what I saw. I and you said... That, yes. There's an archangel here. I said, what? And, um, and I said, who? And you said, I don't know. <laughs> but immediately I turned to my Bible and my Bible immediately opened to Daniel 10. And it says, then Michael, incidentally, this was the 21st of May, 2009. And so after 21 days, then Michael, and I read that. I went, it's Michael, <laughs> you know, and, 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 um, and at that moment I saw, and I saw this foot bigger than I could imagine and an angel bigger than I've ever seen. I went, what on earth? And since then, I've seen him a few times and people right. freak out like, you saw Michael? And it's like, listen, you see angels like money and commerce. And yeah, I see ones that are in the Bible. I'm okay with that. If you have a problem with, with the angels I see, you know, I might have a problem with the angels you see. But <laughs> <laughs> it's... it's um, but in that, it's very interesting because you begin reading through the passage. It's actually about both Daniel 9 and 10 and the process of what happens. And, and I think this is important because of what Jesus is going to leave us with in, in this hour, that we, we have to understand that um, we have to seek him. Daniel received a revelation. He actually received it from a being who it says, he was clothed in linen, but his, his legs were like burnished bronze that out of his mouth, it was like rivers of living water, rivers of water, many waters. And you, you begin reading this, you go, wait a second, this is the same guy in revelation one that is trying to get to Daniel. No, theologically, everything inside of me flipped out. I went, I said, I don't believe this because I've always believed that Jesus, who is God, fully God, um, and I'm exposing something right now that I don't know if I ever would have done on, on a public forum like this, but it's okay, because I believe it's truth. And um, at that point in time, I said, God, I will never teach this, because it sounds like error to me. Hmm. But as I began reading about this man who was trying to, trying to break through to Daniel, I go, wow. This is Revelation 1. This is, this is Jesus. How? What, 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 it, what's this about? And, um, and so I, I said, Lord, this is not true. And he says, really? He said, when was the lamb slain? I said, from the foundations of the earth. And he says, when do you think I laid aside everything? I said, well, I assumed you laid everything aside when you came to earth as a baby. He said, really? I said, well, I assumed that. I said, you know, I think it's pretty normal. You came, you know, you were seed from God, born the Virgin Mary here on earth. He said, and what about when I wrestled with Jacob and I couldn't overpower him? I went, oh, you couldn't overpower him? No. And he said, and what about all the other situations where through the Old Testament, you would see me as this man? I, and then he took me to the New Testament. And he said, he came as a baby. He was fully, I said, why do I need to know this? <laughs> and he said, Danny, he says, people need to know this because they need to understand that the things that I did, I did completely dependent upon my father. That if the father wasn't doing them, I couldn't do them. That if I wasn't hearing the father, I couldn't say them. People just believe that because I was God, I, that's how healings happen. That's how miracles happen. That's how I heard the father's voice, that their dependency was not on me, that, their, that my dependency was on myself. And he says, but I, I had laid that aside at the foundation, before the foundations of the world. I said, wow. 
that's good. And then he took me further. I remember Bob Jones saying to me, he says, the most important verse in all the Bible is Acts 3.21. I went, what? Acts 3.21? I didn't even know it in those days. But it, it, it says, you know, he says, seek the Lord, times of refreshing will come. He says, he, talking about Jesus, he must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things. So that Jesus right now is literally in heaven waiting for something to occur. Right. Now we think he's waiting. Most people just believe he's waiting for the father saying, she's ready, go. That's what we think. But there's something about the restoration of all things where God is about to restore all things. And I think a part of those all things come out in Philippians chapter two, where it says that he, I'll read this. Um, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow heaven, um, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the, God the Father. They call that the kenosis. They call it the where he emptied himself, completely emptied himself. And I believe that the emptying himself is yet to happen, or, or the filling up of the emptied self, that I believe that he emptied himself. He went to the Father. He's at the Father. He is right there. And the Father is, there is a time where he will return with all the angels of heaven, with the hosts of heaven, with the tattoo down his side at that point, which he has not had. That says, King of kings and Lord of lords, that he will come riding on that white horse, that, that we, we've all talked about. And, and I believe that it is, it is, that is the restoration of all things, restoring it all back to before the beginning, that what, what happened to him before the beginning of the foundations of the earth, that God is going to restore all authority, all power, all glory, all majesty to Jesus, that the restoration isn't just about us being restored. It's about literally the purposes of God being restored for all of time. And that right. in that, there will, all these things will be swept up, that, that this whole junk that we're dealing with is all going to be resolved, and, and there's going to be resolution, it's going to be resolved, there's going to be a, a, a release of the kingdom of God in such a way that it will look like what the kingdom of God has always supposed to have looked like, and not what, what happened because of the garden, that God will restore right. all things. So... I believe it's so important that we understand this because otherwise people begin to adapt their lifestyle to living with the Nephilim, living with the demonic, living in a very fallen world and having to say, well, it's just the way it is. When in fact, God has called us to a much higher place and saying, no, we deal with these things. We face them down. We, we release the authority that God has given to us, that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, that all of creation is looking for the children, the sons of God, who will demand, command, and release the authority of heaven, that even though in Adam we all fell, in Christ we've all been raised again. And in his raising, we absolutely carry his authority on the earth to bring freedom, deliverance, healing, and everything else. Right. Yeah. So anyways. Totally agree. That's good. Well, you, you mentioned uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, uh, you know, taking captive and casting down imaginations. And uh, I believe that one thing that the church must do right now is to get back to some Bible basics and um, – begin to filter the news, the, the cultural norms, the sayings, the things that we have become quite comfortable with, uh, normalized in our society in regards to immorality, evil, wickedness, thoughts, sayings. I believe we need to get back to a period where we 
begin to go back to Bible truth and begin to take all these things that are competing, battling for our mind and our soul, and begin to render them out through Scripture and discard them so the church can stand up against them again in truth. Because I'm not convinced the church, by and large, is walking in truth right now. I believe they're walking in cultural truth, not biblical truth. I mean, I know that there are some in some places and some people, thank God for them. But by and large, the church today has become, in my uh, view, uh, mostly asleep. They're unaware of what's going on, of what's coming. In the sense of biblical ramifications and prophecies that have foretold these times, therefore, they're unprepared to deal with it. And uh, they have given, you know, over and over and over their biblical authority. Uh, they stopped standing. They start sitting. Now they're lying down. I mean, everything's trying to run on the church, but that's the plan of the end. Come and on. So at some point, we have to be fed up with it. We have to have enough of it. And we have to begin to really resist it at every point within every opportunity we have. So I'm, I'm saying and prophesying, calling the church now to rise up and resist. You know, rise and resist. We need to get the resistance movement yeah. going very, very strong. Not just one or two voices. Uh, no. We need within the body of Christ a serious resistance moving movement to, to, to blow back, to, to push back on the narrative on. that's coming our way today. We've got to have it. Otherwise, uh, the generation coming up with us uh, and, and after us is not going to have a mooring. They're not going to have a compass. They're not going to have an understanding. And they're going to be living with a uh, worldview, not a biblical worldview. Yep. And they're going to be subject to whatever comes down, especially yeah. deception. So I really pray that the resistance moving, movement within the church would rise up uh, across the board, uh, really rise up, resist the lies, resist the, the uh, draconian laws, resist you know all that yep. um, any uh, wickedness that any uh, organization or even government would try to promote. We have to resist these things mm -hmm. strongly uh, to show the truth, to show our faith, uh, you know, people say, well, let's just pray. I'm like, well, praying's fine, but the Bible is pray and do action. It's not just prayer. It's prayer right. and action. And yep. we forgot the action part. We're all into prayer. Yep. You know, we pat ourselves on the back. Well, that was a great prayer session. Well, where's your action? You, you know, you can't go out the front door and then let everything you just prayed against roll over you, right? So I'm, I'm looking for the uh, voices uh, to begin Come to rise. On. The leaders begin to get fed up with it. You know what uh, this world has put on us. You know, they've tried to silence our worship, our meeting, our gatherings, this this whole scenario yeah. we're in right now. We know why that is. Yeah. Because no resistance to evil, it's going to come. Yeah, and absolutely. We know the Nephilim spirit's coming strong because the, they bring the curse with them. They were cursed in the garden and they yeah. bring the curse with them. And the curse is in Deuteronomy 20 through 31. Madness, lunatic. Sickness, disease. I mean, why is why are so many people and some of our leaders just absolutely mad and lunatics? Because they're operating the spirit of that curse, which yeah. God says, I'm going to put on them madness, Come on. lunacy. Uh, and you, it's manifesting. You, you see some things are going on. You go, what? What? Yeah, that doesn't exactly. make sense. What is it? It's that Nephilim spirit, that cursed spirit of iniquity coming up on leaders and speakers and they're absolutely mad and they're lunatics and it's very biblical and that's what we're dealing with so um we need to use our greatest weapon the gospel absolutely the power of the gospel and the gifts of the spirit and begin to one by one take the feet out from under this um army that has escalated as of yep. late against us and usurped yep, usurped is the word they have they have. It's a usurping government and a usurping demonic entity. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We're not unwise. I mean, believers, true believers that are close with the Lord, they can discern. We see what's going on. And yeah. in that, uh, I believe God's bringing an awakening of truth, much like you and I are talking about today. What's driving all this? What's the source? What authority do we right. have? Over it? What do we do? And we have to go back to our Bibles. Genesis 3.15, the seed wars. Uh, the sons of God, the Elohim that are uh, have been given to rule over the nations of the earth right now, which all the nations are going to be given back to Christ and he is going to rule over them. But right now, uh, those of us who are redeemed, the Lord, we have been repositioned and, 
and we have been restored as the rulers of wherever we live to bring the kingdom. We've got to do that. We have to be yep. the resistance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I think, I think, you know, it's kind of interesting that we're actually doing this today because I think it's tomorrow that all the stuff comes out. <laughs> so uh, it's great timing. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think the excitement is that God's up to something huge right now. Um, yeah. Two weeks ago, I was headed to Montana the next day and um, had a wonderful time in Montana. But um, uh, the day before I get a, a message from somebody and they say, I'm trying to figure out how to sign up for your conference um, in October. I went, what conference in October? I don't have a conference in October. They said, it's on your website. It's called The Remnant is Rising. Well, Randy, if you know anything about me, <laughs> I, that's not a term I am I have yeah. avidly used for sure. Right. Right. And, um, and so I went, I looked on my website, sure enough, there is a conference October 21st to 23rd on my website. The remnant is rising. I'm like, whoa, I think we're doing a conference October 21st to 23rd. And so I'm like, all right, Lord, you know, you, you're, <laughs> he is taking over. Uh, and um, I'm, uh, isn't that awesome? So we well, don't know yeah. where, <laughs> we don't know how, we don't know who, we don't, we don't know anything. All I know is that something's about to happen, and I'm pretty excited about it. Pretty so. wild. No, yeah, wild? I guess nothing's impossible. No. No, I just want to pray for people real quick if we can. Sure, yeah. So, so Lord, I, I'm asking, Father, this is very unique information. And unique is not the right word, Lord. It's biblical. There, there are biblical foundations to what we've been talking about. But there is a generation, Lord that is so muddled and confused. And I'm asking God right now, you take what has been shared here and you use it in people's lives just to bring truth, to, to, to bring them to that place, Lord, where they are not schemed against by the enemy, but that, Father, where they're aware of the enemy's schemes so they can follow you. Lord, I ask that people's minds, their hearts, their thoughts be so set on you, that, Lord, that in the, in the coming days and months and weeks, um, Father, that there will be a release of your presence on people's lives, that, that Lord, there will be an incredible uh, drawing together of truth. You said, Father, that your children are led by the Spirit of God. And I'm asking God that right now that you would raise up a generation who are led by the Spirit of God that will demonstrate they are the children of God. They are the sons of God on the earth. Father, I'm asking just for breakthrough. I'm asking, Father, where there have been doubts, where there have been uh, things that have been shattered, where people don't know how to get free. I'm asking God today that you begin bringing freedom. I ask God you bring people who have been de demonically controlled in families. Father, I'm asking that you bring them under the subjection of the cross. And Father, that you would bring healing and deliverance and freedom. Father, for the demonic doctrines that have just been flying through the church, Father, decimate them. Bring them mm -hmm. to nothing and reveal your hand. Reveal the truth of who you are to this generation, Lord. We ask, God, that many, many, many will come to you. And Lord, yes. we look forward to seeing a remnant arising that looks like something that Jesus raised up and not something men have. I ask for that, God, in your precious name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, and I just agree with Danny, and I say, yes, Lord, to you be the glory in all things. Let this message go to who it needs to go to. Let the ears of the hearer be quickened and awakened to truth. Let all lies and deceptions be broken, and let truth set them free. In Jesus' name, raise up the resistance. Yes, Amen. Lord. Amen. Amen. I love you, my brother. I'll be talking to you soon. All righty. <laughs> my, re my remnant friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Remnant it friend. is. Yes. Uh, proof is not too many people are talking about what you and I are talking about. Amen. I know. It's good. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Be blessed. Say hi all to right. them. Okay. All right. God bless. Okay, bye-bye.